The stories of Souls games have always revolved around bosses, but that statement has never been more true than for Dark Souls 3. If you understand who you're killing in this game, then you will understand the story. The first one in your way is Udex Gundir, the Ashen Judge and Scabbard to the Coiled Sword of the Shrine. This sword is bequeathed only to Chosen Ash, who can best him in battle. But before he was the Ashen Judge, Gundir walked through this place much like we did, on his way to meet his Firekeeper and link the fire. Charged with a duty and granted a cast iron halberd that would never crumble, Gundir arrived late, greeted by a shrine without fire and a bell that would not toll. The flame had already faded, and his firekeeper had been thrown into the depths of the bell tower, grave of firekeeper's past. She never met her champion, and the ensuing tragic farce became a favorite tale of the masses. And after he was bested by an unknown warrior, which is probably us, Gundir the champion became sheathed to a coiled sword in the hopes that someday the first flame would be linked once more. Perhaps Gundir, with his unbreakable halberd, was fated to eternal service from the beginning. Since it's implied that Gundir expected to meet a firekeeper, he was likely meant as a candidate for linking the fire. Those capable of linking the fire are named Lords of Cinder, beings capable of bringing back the world from the brink of darkness by linking the first flame. Indeed, the game speaks of three Lords of Cinder who have already linked the fire, and they're being resurrected as a last resort to link it once again. In the opening cutscene, you saw them. Aldrich, Saint of the Deep, Yorm the Giant, and Farron's Abyss Watchers. Each of these lords once had an age of their own, and the remnants of their age lives on in Dark Souls 3 and in their resurrection. For example, Aldrich is linked to these bosses and their stories, the Abyss Watchers are linked here, and those in Lothric are conjoined here. For simplicity's sake, we're going to discuss these stories in three chunks, starting with Aldrich, Pontiff Sullivan, Vort, and the Dancer, who all reside in the Boreal Valley. The Boreal Valley is currently ruled over by Pontiff Sullivan, a tyrant who sends his outrider knights to serve as his watchful eyes and his guards. And the first knight of Pontiff Sullivan we meet is Vort, an outrider knight who ambushes us as we attempt to leave Lothric. So, the Outrider Knight's job is to keep an eye on things. Sullivan's knights are also described as his watchful eyes and his punitive blades. Each Outrider Knight is provided with a ring by the Pontiff, which transforms them into frenzied beasts and lures them into battles of death. Specifically, the two main Outrider Knights we see upon the High Wall of Lothric appear at both points of progression in the area, so perhaps they serve as strategically placed guards in order to hinder our progression, and for Sullivan to keep an eye on the world. When you went through Irithyll, I'm sure you noticed those ghosts that seem to be walking the streets. Well, they likely represent the Outrider Knights before their departure and descent into madness, because two in particular are very interesting. They walk together, one man, one female, and the woman wears the mask of the Dancer. Vort was never far from the fleeting Dancer, who watches over Emma in Lothric's Grand Cathedral. The Dancer is far more intriguing than Vort is. The Pontiff ordered her to serve as a Dancer, and then he ordered her to serve as his Outrider Knight. He bestowed enchanted swords upon her, one dark and one light, mirroring his own. Eventually, the black eyes of the Pontiff transformed her into a beastly creature, her gauntlets fusing with her own hide. The fascinating thing about the Dancer, though, is who she was before she became Sullivan's pet. It's a very popular theory that she is one of the three daughters of Guinevere who appear in game. Here's the evidence. Her Aurora Veil is said to be an article of the Old Gods, which is permitted only for direct descendants of the Old Royal Family. The Dancer's soul can also be transposed to give you the spell Soothing Sunlight, Miracle of Guinevere of the Old Royalty. Guinevere used to reside in Anorlondo, home of the gods, and her line continues in Lothric. So Guinevere was also revered as a goddess of fertility and bounty. She raised many heavenly children and the dancer, having one of the three sunlight spells, is clearly one of them. 
And of course, as you know, Pontiff Sullivan, the tyrant, now rules over Irithyll and Anor Londo, so it's my belief that Sullivan gained power within Anor Londo, then proclaimed himself Pontiff, and ordered Guinevere's daughter to serve as his dancer, and then outride a knight. The royal family was usurped and devoured and torn apart by Sullivan, who, Yoshka says, wrongfully proclaimed himself Pontiff. Even after the family's passing, the Silver Knights looked over their manor and the ruined cathedral. The story behind Pontiff Sullivan's rise to power is told lightly, with only clues peeking above the surface, but in a nutshell, I believe Pontiff Sullivan took over Anor Londo from within, probably with the help of the Deacons of the Deep. The only ones in his way were the Dark Moon Knights. The Dark Moon Knights were once led by my elder brother, the Dark Sun Gwendolyn, but he was stricken by illness, and leadership of the Knights fell to me. Then, Sullivan wrongfully proclaimed himself Pontiff, and took me prisoner. Oh, where could my dear brother be? So when I say that Pontiff Sullivan took over Anor Londo from within, it is speculation on my part, but my reasoning is that he knew of Gwendolyn, and he knew of Yorshka, and he wrongfully proclaimed himself Pontiff, which all imply that he was a part of the system already. A pontiff is essentially a high priest, and the miracles, the weaponry, and the rings of the Dark Moon all rely on faith. Additionally, there's a bit more evidence that the pontiff was a part of the Dark Moon system already. The sword in his left hand is a ceremonial sword, representing the judgement of the moon. However, its magic is far closer to sorcery than any existing lunar power. Its dark blue hues, deeper than the darkest moon, reflect Sorcerer Sullivan's true nature. Yoshka calls Sullivan a tyrant, which can mean someone who elects themselves ruler without legal right. This, along with his Great Sword of Judgment that references the moon, furthers that idea that he took over from within, the figurehead of a movement that was abandoning their faith in favour of Sullivan's true calling, Dark Sorceries. And the same sort of shift was happening amongst the Deacons of the Deep, who we find all throughout Anor Londo. Originally, though, they were a group of clergymen dedicated to sealing away the potential horrors of the Deep. Deep protection tells us that the Deep was originally a peaceful and sacred place, its deacons wearing dark red robes denoting their blessing of fire. Over time, however, the Deep became the final rest for many abhorrent things, and, indeed, human dregs were likely some of those things, as the dregs of humanity are said to sink to the lowest depths imaginable, forming the bedrock of the world. Those who linger too long on the brink of the deep will often slip, and lurking within the deep are insects which tear open the skin and burrow into flesh. Eventually, those dedicated to sealing away the horrors of the deep succumb to its very power. An example of this is their Tome of Knowledge, which was originally intended to teach divine protection, but it had dark tales added to its pages, making it a thing most profane. And along with this descent, presumably, was Aldrich, Saint of the Deep. A right and proper cleric, only he developed a habit of devouring men. He ate so many that he bloated like a drowned pig, then softened into sludge. So they stuck him in the Cathedral of the Deep, and they made him a Lord of Cinder, not for virtue, but for might. Aldrich was this simple saint who became a hugely powerful being, eventually chosen, maybe willingly and maybe not, to become a Lord of Cinder and link the fire. The Deacon Skirt tells us that the Deacons tended to the flame, and I'm perhaps inclined to believe that this meant that maybe they were tending to the flame of Aldrich when he was a Lord of Cinder. And whether this is true or not, we do know that the Deacons eventually succumbed to the horrors of the Deep, and neither tending to the flame nor the faith could save them. You would have noticed that many deacons cast Dark Soul sorceries, which were imparted to them by Archdeacon MacDonnell, an adherent of Aldrich who was largely responsible for the corruption of the deacons. 
Archdeacon MacDonald delighted in the cathedral's stagnating souls. For him, they represented the glorious bedrock of this world. Under the guidance of Archdeacon MacDonald, these deacons became both clergymen and sorcerers. The Archdeacon's sin, as it's called, was to channel faith for sorcery, which transformed his staff from a symbol of religious authority into a catalyst of dark sorceries. The deacons, they still had faith, but it was not in fire any longer. It was in Aldrich, Saint of the Deep, their master. Upon his resurrection, Aldrich, like many Lords of Cinder, ruminated on the fading of the fire. For him, it inspired visions. He saw beyond the Age of Fire to the Age of Deep Waters and the coming Age of the Deep Sea. Filled with new purpose, he knew what he had to do. He would devour the gods himself. When we get to the Deacons of the Deep, we expect to find Aldrich in his coffin, but he's already left for his home in the Boreal Valley. The Deacons here are led by Archdeacon Royce, who is one of the three Archdeacons who remained behind to keep eternal watch over his master's coffin, hoping that one day he would return. Aldrich left behind a small doll in his coffin that Pontiff Sullivan gave to his most valued subjects. Wherever you go, the moon sets in Irithyll. Wherever you may be, Irithyll is your home. When Aldrich left, Archdeacon MacDonnell went with him. We come across MacDonnell in the depths of Anor Londo, and MacDonnell, like many other deacons, is obese. He's huge, and I see that as a legacy of Aldrich, who derived power from gluttony. They're clearly mimicking him. In Anor Londo, Archdeacon MacDonnell came to lead the Aldrich faithful, who are defenders, who exist to ensure that Aldrich, devourer of gods, remains undisturbed. And when we come across Aldrich, we realize why he wants to be undisturbed. Because Pontiff Sullivan, with a devourer of gods by his side, has imprisoned a god of the old royalty in the abandoned cathedral to be fed to the devourer. Gwyndolin, son of Gwyn and prior leader of the Dark Moon Knights, was gradually devoured by Aldrich. As Aldrich slowly devoured the god of the Dark Moon, he dreamt. In this dream, he saw the form of a young, pale girl in hiding. And we know this is Yorshka, who was sister to Gwyndolin, and a half-breed who is parallel to Priscilla from Dark Souls 1. But the interesting thing about this is the dream that Aldrich had, because apparently Aldrich only needs to dream about someone to learn their skills, for he uses Priscilla's life hunt scythe in battle. And this fact that he can learn things through his visions has some interesting implications, because Aldrich is clearly wielding a Gravelord greatsword upon the end of his spear, which lends credit towards this theory that Aldrich has devoured Nito in some capacity, and he is called the devourer of gods, plural, after all. So another question becomes, did Aldrich also devour Nito? Well, he has the wispy Nito-like cloak with skulls within it, but I think it's more likely that these skulls are just remnants of other humans that he's devoured. You have to remember there is no concrete evidence that he has devoured Nito, and I personally think it's more likely that he simply dreamt up the Gravelord spell in a similar manner to which he dreamt up the Life Hunt Scythe from Yoshka. But what you think shapes the story here, so let me know. So, that's all of the Pontiff's lackeys explained for the most part, and the biggest unanswered questions here to go into in other videos is what exactly the relationship between Salavan and the Deacons is, and in what order this story of corruption and treachery played out, because timeline is always one of the hardest things to get right in the Soul series. But the biggest curiosity, in my opinion, and the one that really, really interests me are Aldrich's visions of the Age of the Deep Sea. From a being, remember, that has visions so accurate he can learn spells from those visions. So, in a franchise that's entirely self-contained within this Age of Fire and its cycles, this, this vision of the Deep Sea, it's pretty much the only mention of a different future. And 
Its appearance in these descriptions feels so out of place that I almost expect it to be referenced in the future in some capacity. Uh, assuming it's not just a reference to Bloodborne, maybe this indicates what Miyazaki is doing next on one of his projects, or maybe we'll see something related to this in the DLC. Moving on. Something set Sullivan down this path. When Sullivan was a young sorcerer, he discovered the profaned capital, and down there, he discovered an unfading flame below a distant tundra of Irithyll, and when he found this, a burning ambition took root within him. The profaned flame. The origins of it aren't known, but we do know a few things. We know it's an unfading flame, we know that it can be manipulated, and we know that it swallows the hearts of those who wield it. The pontiff himself imbued his greatsword with this fire, and he also gave it to his holy knights. Shortly after he did this, the fire witches had their hearts swallowed by the flame. And as one last example of its corrupting influence, the handmaidens who wield it down in the profaned capital, their dagger says that they take pleasure in wounding others. And of course, the pontiff himself doesn't exactly have a very good moral compass. But apart from that, we know precious little about the profaned flame. And this has been the hardest part of the script to write for me, because the profaned flame defies all categorization as flames that have existed previously in the series. So I'm going to work on my theories on it, and while I'm doing that, I'll list those theories in the description, because I could talk about this thing for a very long time without actually getting anywhere. But the final thing, and maybe the most important thing we know about the profaned flame, is that your the giant became a lord of cinder to put it to rest. Now, clearly, Yorm was not successful, because the profaned flame has infiltrated almost all of Irithyll and set a lot of events in motion. This just adds even more tragedy to Yorm's tale. Yorm is the descendant of an ancient conqueror, and was asked by the very people once subjugated to lead them. Serving as both a weighty blade and a stone-hard shield, Yorm fought unflinchingly as a one-man vanguard, but one day he lost the one he wished to protect. In response, he threw down his great shield and added a left-handed notch to his machete instead so he could two-hand it, for he no longer had anything left to protect. All the while, his human subjects appeared quite disrespectful of him. They were insincere when they called him a lord, and they doubted him. He is called Lonely Yorm in his cinders, and perhaps that's because he lost the one he wished to protect, or perhaps because he didn't have the love of his people. At some point, the profaned flame became a real problem in the capital, for according to his cinders, Yorm decided to sacrifice himself and become a lord of cinder to put the profaned flame to rest. I don't know why Yorm decided that, hey, I'm gonna put out fire with fire, because when he did this, fire rained down from the sky and incinerated naught but human flesh. This is an interesting insight into who the linking of the fire consumes. It consumed humans and humans alone, and you see their disfigured, smelted corpses all around Yorm's chamber. Before he linked the fire, however, Yorm left behind two storm rulers, which was a legendary greatsword, also known as the Giant Slayer, for the residual strength of storm that brings giants to their knees. So this thing could kill giants, and one he gave to the humans who doubted him, he called them out on their cowardly words and gave them a weapon capable of killing him, and the other storm ruler he gave to a dear friend in return for a promise. This dear friend was Sigurd, who journeys to the profaned capital in order to uphold his promise and slay his old friend. Presumably, Yorm asked Sigurd to kill him if he ever betrayed his duty, and Sigurd does so, seeing that Yorm has not returned to link the fire once again. The profaned capital also had its sorcerers, who claimed heirship to the legacy of the renowned scholar Big Hat Logan, even going so far as to emulate the type of staff he used. But halfway across the world, I know of two crystal sages who emulated him even more closely. These crystal sages served as spiritual guides to the scholars of Lothric's grand archives, and one of them went on to ally with the Undead Legion. The Undead Legion of Farron was a caravan of undead, 
dedicated to the eradication of the abyss wherever it was found. The Abyss Watchers, as they were called, follow the duty and the form of the Wolf Knight of Dark Souls 1, known as Artorius the Abyss Walker. They are essentially his legacy. They made their home in Farren Keep, and high above Farren Keep lies an emaciated old wolf. The Abyss Watchers, for their hunting of the Abyss, they required some art that went beyond any existing art. Wolf's Blood, the legacy of Artorius, provided just that. Their pointed steel helm became shirked as this sinister omen by the masses, because, think about it, if you saw that pointed steel helmet coming towards your kingdom, you knew you were in trouble, because these guys are dedicated to taking out the abyss. And indeed, their home in Farron might just be set above such a kingdom, for below are the catacombs of Carthus, and sealed within a goblet, deep below in the catacombs, is the encounter with High Lord Walnir, a ruler who succumbed to the Abyss. Before succumbing to the Abyss, Walnir was a conqueror. He ruled over the people of Carthus of the Sands, formidable warriors who were masters of the curved sword, and also of pyromancies that enhanced the effectiveness of their curved swords. The swordsmen attached great value to victory, at all costs, for where was the honour in death? They lived for their High Lord Walnir, who was conqueror of most lands known to their people, and yeah, you can see why they loved him. In Walnir's time, there were other lords who had their crowns rightfully bequeathed upon them, but Walnir brought them to their knees and ground their crowns to dust, forming his own crown from theirs, for he was the one High Lord, keen to outlive all others. Reminds me a lot of what we did in Dark Souls 2. Anyway, Somehow, Walnir himself fell to the abyss, and he was gripped by this fear of true darkness, and he pleaded to the gods for the first time. In our boss fight with him, there is a darkness below Walnir, and it's struggling to consume him, but Walnir had his holy sword, and he had three armlets which he had stripped from the corpses of clerics, and these things gave him some semblance of comfort. Of course, we destroy the bracelets, and the Abyss finally consumes him. While he was in the Abyss, however, Walnir was not inactive. Black Serpent is this pyromancy that was discovered from the Abyss by Walnir, which went on to inspire the black arts of his Grave Wardens. The Grave Warden Pyromancy Tome was developed by his Grave Wardens, who discovered his pyromancies. And going back up for a second, Walnir and the Abyss, their proximity to the Abyss Watchers probably isn't coincidence. In fact, it makes quite a lot of sense for Carthus to be one of the kingdoms that the Abyss Watchers toppled. So let's go back up to the Abyss Watchers for a second and see if this theory holds any weight. Eventually, the Abyss Watchers became Lords of Cinder. Their shared wolf's blood served their mandate as Lords. Essentially, it met the requirements. To gain access to the Abyss Watchers, you have to extinguish three flames. And I always wondered why this ritual existed. It felt very video gamey and out of place. But I went through once more recently and I looked really closely at the engravings behind each flame. One looks like the Four Kings, one looks like Nito, and one looks like the Bed of Chaos, three of the main lords in Dark Souls 1. And these were the souls you had to collect to gain access to Gwyn and open a giant stone door. So. These are likely here to symbolize that, right? We're extinguishing three flames and we're opening the door that explains the ritual. Anyway, that's more a piece of trivia than anything. After the Legion's Watchers became Lords of Cinder, the wolf blood dried up and Farron was consumed by a festering wood. Dark wraiths began to roam, the keep fell to ruins, and as suggested by many of you in my lore through, the Abyss Watchers, upon being resurrected to link the fire once more, may have been affected by the Abyss as well. So here's the theory. The Abyss Watchers were driven to seek out the Abyss, right? Well, what if, upon their resurrection, the Abyss far below in the catacombs of Carthus crept into the Abyss Watchers themselves. This would explain why the Abyss Watchers are locked into endless combat with themselves, because they're driven to seek out the Abyss, but they also can't die, so they're locked into endless combat. 
When I read this theory in the comments, something else clicked as well. The Wolf Knight armor, which belonged to Artorius, who fell to the Abyss, says that the armor of the Abyss Watchers suggests their own eventual end. So the game is drawing a parallel here between Artorius and the Abyss Watchers. It's saying that the armor of the Abyss Watchers shows that they're falling to the Abyss as well. And here's the really interesting thing. When you look closely at their armor, you realize it has black tendrils of the Abyss rising up. So the armor is showing us that they fell to the Abyss. Probably. This theory isn't concrete, and no one should take it as such, but I think it's the best explanation for their infighting. It's my favorite explanation, anyway. And mostly, this one was all you guys, so thank you. Onwards to Lothric. The Knights of Lothric were hunters of dragons, explaining their affinity with lightning and why they worshipped the sun. They have since tamed dragons, and with their drakes, they once crushed anything that threatened their shores. The knight has served as one of the three pillars of Lothric since ancient times, and it shares place alongside the wyverns as a symbol of Lothric. However, tales of dragon slayers are now a rare thing, and they're told only in fragments and whispers in remote regions. The Dragon Slayer armor lost its master long ago, but it still remembers the sporting hunts they shared together. When we fight against it, the armor retains its master's fighting style, but now it has a new master, the Pilgrim Butterfly. Now, the soul of the Dragon Slayer armor is the only mention of these butterfly creatures, so speculation abounds whenever you talk about them. When you look up at them closely though, closer than the game intends you to ever get, you'll see that they're flesh and bone, and they're almost bent backwards with a ribcage jutting outwards. Now, their name is one of the biggest clues that we have, and the word pilgrim makes me think of the pilgrims of Londor, who all died on their way to the peak of Lothric. And just like these pilgrims, these pilgrim butterflies fly upwards to the peak of Lothric as well. And in both these cases, with the pilgrims and the pilgrim butterflies, we have no real idea why either of them are going up. So perhaps we'll learn more if we ever get Londor-themed DLC, and I think that's pretty likely. I'm going to list two other theories in the description about the butterflies, because the bottom line is we don't know what they are. Next is the Archives, and beyond the Archives is Prince Lothric and his brother, Lorien. Curiously, these are the only Lords of Cinder who were not featured in the opening cutscene of Lords being resurrected, and I believe that's because they never linked the fire. And I think their rejection of linking the fire might have been what set all of the desperate resurrections into motion. This is just a theory, but I think it's backed up by most of these descriptions and this dialogue. Prince Lothric is in your hands. Please save his soul. Tell him what he must be a lord. So there's Prince Lothric and Lorien, his brother. Lorien is the eldest, and before he was crippled, he was a knight who single-handedly slayed a demon prince, the victory eternally scorching his sword with flame. The Cinders of a Lord state that the Lothric bloodline was obsessed with creating a worthy heir. They needed someone to link the flame, and for some reason Prince Lorien did not suffice. So they put their faith in their next born, Prince Lothric. As his throne states, last hope of his line. Prince Lothric, destined to be a Lord of Cinder, was born into swaddling clothes used in ancient prayer, and they are all that he has ever worn. He was cherished by the royal family, despite being born into illness, a frail and shriveled child. He was their last hope, and meant to be a champion, but some things will remain distant dreams forever. Linking the fire proved impossible, so the family resorted to unspeakable means. Descriptions don't say or imply what these unspeakable means are, so that's up to us to guess at. But after mentioning these unspeakable means, the cinder description goes on to say that the path to linking the fire is a cursed one indeed. So Prince Lothric was cursed. With what, we don't know. But Lorien embraced his brother's curse, leaving him mute and crippled. It is said that Lorien 
the one who embraced the curse, did so willingly and embraced his fate. When we kill Lorien in the boss fight, Lothric resurrects him, saying, for that is our curse. So maybe being unable to die itself is the fire-linking curse, and why he says, You remain among the accursed. After becoming one, the soul of the twin princes says that they rejected their duty to become lords of Cinder, and settled down far, far away to watch the fire fade from a distance. The curse has made their souls nearly inseparable. So why did Lothric grow to despise and reject his duty as a lord of Cinder? Well, it's very likely due to a man named as the First of the Scholars. Soulstream says that, he was alleged to be a private mentor of the royal prince, and that he doubted the linking of the fire. So it's very likely that this scholar was the one who made Lothric reject his fate as a Lord of Cinder. And there is so much more to the tale of Lothric, but we don't have time. I want to talk about the kingdom, about the royal family, but this video is only about the main bosses, so I still have to mention Osiris, King of Lothric, and his wife, the Queen. So please subscribe and look out for the optional bosses lore video. And the final main boss, the being we fight after the Firekeeper chastises the lords for going without thrones, is the soul of Cinder itself located within the Kiln of the First Flame. The soul of Cinder is actually a fairly easy being to explain. Ever since Lord Gwyn, the first Lord of Cinder, many exalted lords have linked the First Flame, and it is their very souls that have manifested themselves as Defender of the Flame. The soul of Cinder is their deific manifestation. More specifically, it's clear that the soul of Cinder is this conglomerate of players themselves, us from previous games and cycles who have linked the fire. Using the ninja flip ring from Dark Souls 1, curved swords, pyromancies, sorceries, miracles, and in phase 2, the music shifts to this twisted tribute of Gwyn's theme as he takes on the First Lord's fighting style. The kiln also, it represents the state of the world if you look behind you. It's a city twisted and distorted and folded in on itself, just like the entire game and bosses we just journeyed through. Dark Souls 3 contains the histories, the people, and the lands of the Abyss Watcher's Age, of the Pontiff and Aldrich's Age, of Yorm's Age, and the story of Lothric that literally seems to have called forth Old Lords of Cinder to link the fire once again. And as you stand in front of the flame, four choices lay before you, more than any previous game. But that's a video and a story for another time, for this video is far, far too long already, and judging by my analytics for videos like this, only half of the people who started watching this video will still be watching now. So to you guys, thank you for sticking it through. This video took a really long time to make. And the major shout out in this video has to go to a guy who runs a YouTube channel named AGR Cactus. He taught me how to use a lot of these camera tricks and this video would not look half as good if it wasn't for his guidance. He has this video called The Beauty of Lothric, which really shows off how beautiful this game is when you look at it from angles that the game developers didn't exactly expect us to look at it from. So do me a favor and check it out and subscribe to him. It's crazy, I've probably been talking for about half an hour now, and I haven't covered nearly as much as I would have liked to have covered. So for that, we have the Law Through series, which is dedicated to being really in-depth as we go through every single area in the game, and to bring out the characters and their stories and what their stories relate to, we have Prepare to Cry, and for everything else we have The Secrets videos. But next is a video just like this one, which gives you an overview of the optional bosses. And whether you're a patron or a viewer, thank you for watching, and I'll talk to you next time.